Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our next session, which is the business of giant screen films. This section is actually going to be divided into four different parts. Um, we have part of it before lunch and part of it after lunch. So we're going to talk first um, about the economic model of a giant screen film. Then we're going to move into a panel discussion uh, that involves financing. After lunch, we'll be talking about budgeting and then marketing and distribution. Um, I am your moderator for this entire uh, session before and after lunch. And to introduce myself, my name is Kim Nichols, and I'm a CPA. I spent most of my career in public accounting. And in 2008, I uh, went to work at the Putnam Museum in Davenport, Iowa, as their vice president of finance and operations. And part of what I did there was manage their giant screen theater, uh, which at the time was an IMAX theater converted to uh, digital theater in 2012 and adopted the National Geographic brand at that time. Um, when I left the Putnam in 2014, I had developed a very um, strong interest and passion for the giant screen industry, one that I didn't really know anything about when I went to work there. And so when I left there, I decided I was going the direction of opening my own CPA firm, and I wanted to stay connected with the giant screen industry and working with um, producers and filmmakers and different aspects of the business. So that is how I got to be where I am today. Um, I am a member of GSCA. I'm on the Professional Development Committee, the Research Task Force, and I also co-chair what's called the Alternative Content Interest Group. Um, to my right, I have a very distinguished panel. Um, Paul Frazier, who you have already met, he is down at the end. He's going to start us off walking through the economic model. And then I'm going to um, briefly introduce our panelists so we can uh, kind of shave some time off here. Um, we have three people. Uh, we have Jonathan Barker, the CEO of SK Films. Um, brief uh, introduction. He founded SK Films with Bob Kerr, the co-founder of IMAX, where Jonathan had previously ran the worldwide film business and was responsible for production and distribution of a wide range of films. Multiple award-winning giant screen titles in his filmography include Flight of the Butterflies, Bugs, and Into the Deep. Next up, we have Don Kempf. Don is the president and founder of Giant Screen Films and D3D Cinema. Don founded Giant Screen Films together with his brother Steve with a mission to bring enriching and impactful theatrical experiences to audiences worldwide. As a former history teacher, Don's decision to devote his career to educational documentary film production was a natural one. And then in 2009, he founded uh, D3D Cinema, a sister company of GSF dedicated to digital 3D integration and film production. His producing credits include such films as Michael Jordan to the Max, Mummy Secrets of the Pharaohs, Titans of the Ice Age, Journey to Space, and a personal favorite of mine, a recent uh, ESPN 30 for 30 titled Of Miracles and Men. And then we have Lisa Truitt, uh, who you have met. A brief information about Lisa. She is uh, the CEO of Think Creative. Uh, her career has spanned the world of television, feature films, giant screen and specialty cinema, financing film distribution and education. Um, she previously worked at National Geographic. She created the Cinema Ventures business to finance, produce, market, and distribute high entertainment, high -end entertainment properties with concentration on giant screen films. Uh, her producing credits include Mysteries of Egypt, Lewis and Clark, The Great Journey West, Sea Monsters 3D, and Mysteries of the Unseen World. She is now the founder and president of Think Creative, a company focused on creating high-end film, television, and location-based entertainment projects that generate profit while driving engagement. I would encourage all of you, if you want to know more about them, their bios are on the GSC website, and IMDB is a wonderful thing, as you all know. So with that, I'm going to bring Paul up to walk us through the economic model, and then he is going to uh, moderate the panel discussion immediately following that. Great. Hi again, everyone. Thank you, Kim. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I'm going to present a financial picture of giant screen films. Call it the, the economic model of, of giant screen films. Now, it builds on uh, versions of film models that I've developed over the years, including recently for some producer clients. Um, although I'll stress that this is not one from a particular client. This is, I've custom made this as a kind of a tool, really, for this session. Um, I'm, I'm going to use it. I've got it in Excel um, so that I can actually, um, in front of your eyes, I can change key assumptions. And you can see what happens when certain things change and that may have 
be what's going on in the marketplace. Um, you could say this is the uh, 26th anniversary edition because um, way back when, when I worked at IMAX Corporation, among other things that I did, I started the, uh, I guess we originally called it the Theater Manager Seminar, it later became known as IMAX U. We started in the fall of 89 and uh, we, we did it for mainly for the new licensees, um, whether it was executive director or the frontline theater manager or anybody in between, who wanted to get all the information they could possibly get from their colleagues and as well as us, because we were beginning to own and operate our own theaters on best practices for marketing, programming, and operations. And one of the things that we thought was useful was to create, actually walk people through the model from production to distribution to exhibition to find out where the money goes, how the business works economically. We thought that was a useful background um, for theater people to have, even if they weren't getting into production or distribution themselves. So, like I say, you could say this, that was literally the first time I ever did it, and it was a much trimmer version of what I'm going to show you today, because the world got more complicated. But literally, I, the very first version was uh, 26 years ago, um, 26 plus. Now, um, the funny thing is, though, you know, and I found, in fact, I found the hard copy uh, version of this in an old binder from way back when. The funny thing is, the conclusions haven't changed all that much. You know, the, the market's changed, some of the key variables have changed, but a bottom line conclusion, like how much money is it prudent for an investor to put into a film, actually hasn't changed that much in all this time. Okay, so before I launch this model, there's a few caveats I just want to get out of the way. First off, um, this model is not I stress it's not a particular film in disguise. I haven't taken actually somebody's results and just put generic or GS film. Okay, this is something that's really an amalgam of, like I said before, experience that I've had directly and talking to, and also talking to clients and even just friends in the industry who are producers and distributors who've, uh, who were kind enough to share some of their recent data points with me, as long as I didn't say exactly which film they were talking about when we had those conversations. Um, the, um, the other thing is, is that in a way, this is a somewhat, somewhat artificial exercise. When you put up a, a film model for a particular film, you know, keep in mind that um, a producer usually doesn't do just one film. You know, they usually have a few films or many films that they're responsible for at different stages in their life cycle. Same thing with distribution, especially distribution. It's, it doesn't make sense as a business, really, for a distributor to get a one film. Similarly, when we get to the theater side of things, of course, the theater will show plenty more than one film a year. So just keep that in mind. Um, also, when I start showing the key variables that drive the model, um, keep in mind that you've got to start somewhere for this kind of exercise. There are ranges to every one of these numbers, and I'll, I'll speak to them, and our panel will speak to them as well. Um, and also, a simplifying assumption is that uh, especially as we're, we're transitioning out of film, 1570 and whatever's left of 870, uh, into digital, I am not, there, there's no net um, uh, cost of film in this model. I'm assuming, a simplifying assumption is that to the extent that producers and distributors do have cost of film prints, uh, film, film, 1570 or 870, that it's a wash. They have the cost, but they, they collect enough money back from theaters to pay it out. So I, for simplicity, I've just left it out, out of the model. Okay, so I've got a few scenarios. Um, I'm going to run through a few scenarios. I'll try to be as quick as possible. So first off, um, if you can see that, the way I built this is to, there, of course, there are many, many variables, but I, I chose this list of variables to drive the model for, to show you a few different scenarios. You can see them there. Number of theater licenses, the average license fee per theater, and so on. Um, the, if it's got a yellow box, that means it's an input. If it doesn't have yellow, it means there's a formula behind it and, and a result will, will pop out as a result of whatever numbers are input into the yellow. Okay, so, um, so the first scenario. Let's go to the first scenario. Um, this, is, this is actually one, uh, I'll call this the good case. Uh, the good case. So this is one where, um, now let me flip ahead. There's a few different versions of this. So you can see in the good case, I have 125 licenses, an average of 40,000 uh, license fee per theater, an average of 25% uh, admissions. Now again, remember, these are all simplifying assumptions. In the real world, you're going to have a range around all these numbers, and some theaters will pay more, some will pay less. I've got a film production budget of $6 million. Now, 
there are budgets that I'm aware of now that are in the seven to 10 million range, and there are good films that are being made for four, five, and maybe even less. But you start somewhere for a model, call it a $6 million budget. Um, another driver is maximum equity investment. So this is the maximum amount of risk capital that anyone would put into the film. The gap between six and two and a half is, is, um, would be made up in sponsorships or tax credits or some other non-participating or so-called free money. Um, distribution fee, percent of net, uh, net theater emissions. Uh, distribution marketing investment, that would be the distributor, or if it's a producer distributor, the, their distribution wing would put that money in. Distributor fixed other expenses. There are certainly variable expenses, but there are other things, logistical support things that have to be spent by the distributor. Distributor MG, MG stands for minimum guarantee. Sometimes, often it's zero. Sometimes it's higher than 500,000. Sometimes it's not actually cash. Sometimes it's in kind to finish a film. But that's a key assumption in this model. Now, I've also created a button here to turn on or off whether or not there are other theatrical windows besides giant screen. And that includes full dome, smaller flat screen, and theme parks. If we don't want to include that, I can, if I put zero in, it gets rid of it. If I do include it, it's a one, and, 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 I, and you'll see some assumptions later on. Ancillaries means all the non-theatrical sources of revenue. So that's uh, home video, over the top, Amazon, Netflix, whatever. Um, again, this, is, this, this percentage is really all over the map, although in this, in this business, it's never been really that high. And in, in actual dollars, it's you know, certainly compared to the theatrical world, it's not that big. So those are the key drivers. Um, when, I, when I input these, um, you know, the long story short, and I'll show you how I boomerang back to this in a second, but the ultimate, the ultimate uh, gross box office, so the ultimate revenues received by all theatrical platforms uh, is $23 million in this case, um, a producer's net profit of about $1.3 million, and a producer's internal rate of return, just a financial stat, and a way of measuring a, a return on, on capital, 10%. So, by the way, um, when I talk about an economic return, what I mean, and, and people can debate this, um, I, I mean an economic return when, a, when anyone invests in anything, and if they get at least a 20% after-tax internal rate of return, 20 is sort of the bottom of the threshold that says that's an economic return that compensates the investors for the risk. Um, that's debatable. Some people might accept 15 or 10. Uh, other people who are maybe you know, venture capitalists, they may want 35 or 50. But I'm saying for, for the sake of this demonstration or this presentation, I'm saying 20% is the economic return, the IRR. All right, so when I click those in, uh, those, when I put those inputs in, I end up with a number of, this is the summary P&L, and I'm not gonna scare you yet by showing the detailed P&Ls. But I actually have, I actually have uh, three P&Ls here. I have the producer's P&L, I have the distributor's P&L, I have the combination producer and distributor P&L, and I even have an exhibitor's p and I'll come back to that in a second. All right, so, you can see um, the, the net, this nets down to the numbers we saw on the first page. So you can see the $23 million gross for the producer netting down to a producer's profit of 1.3 million, internal rate of return of 10%, and a gross return on investment. Now the ROI is another financial metric that people like to use. This is not an annualized ROI. This is over the life of a project. In this case, it's five years plus however many years you have for production, maybe it's seven. So, in other words, it's not 52% a year, it's 52% 50, it's over the entire life of, of the project. By the way, five years is a simplifying assumption. We all know well that there are many great evergreen titles that go on forever, but for financial planning purposes, it's often proved to just stick with five years. So now, what if you're a distributor? You're not a producer, but you're a distributor for hire. It's somebody else's film. How, does, how do the same set of numbers turn out for you? Well, you can see the same gross. Um, you see that the revenue that the distributor is pulling in and you've got their expenses, their marketing and educational outreach going out. You've got them collecting that money back. You've got their distribution expenses. They've got that collected. They're usually collecting that back too. Um, and so that nets down to a, a bottom line for the distributor. Now, I want to be very clear and careful on this point in case a lot of you are thinking, ooh, I'm going to get into the distribution business. Because that all caps, distri distributors net margin before salaries and overheads. That's really important. Um, because as you know, distribution is a very, very labor intensive, personal, one-on-one -on -one often business. 
And so what I'm not showing here, and this is back to my earlier point about how I'm isolating on one film, but when in reality a distributor who's in the business is going to have a number of titles. So you, if you were to see a distributor's P&L for the year, um, you know, it might even break, break even because I got an awful lot of overheads in order to deliver this service. So I just want to make that really clear. A producer too, by the way, of course producers have overhead, but proportionally probably less per film than distributors because, you know, they're not having to carry the sales, sales effort for five years on. So then what if you're, and this is probably the greatest, uh, yes? Good point. Very good point. Yes. Five years of salary mortgage, just to emphasize that point. Yep. Um, and also, um, now, for the producer distributor, so a very, you know, probably the most common model in this industry is the producer uh, distributes their own product. Now, there are many examples where you've got a hybrid. A producer distributes their own product, but they are, they're also distributor for hire for other producers. But um, this is obviously a very common model for actually everyone uh, on our panel, either currently or in the recent past. Um, and so you can see, and so basically this P&L is a roll up of the first two, that the numbers actually do add to this con same conclusion. Um, and by the way, there you go, there's an internal rate of return. So if you've got both pieces, um, there's your, inter there's your, your, um, your uh, uh, economic return of 20%. This scenario actually delivers that uh, at the 166 level. Hang on, let me just go back. Sorry, it's 125. Sorry, that it is actually 125. There's something. Sorry about that, folks. I just realized something. Ignore, ignore that uh, number. That's actually, uh, yeah, yeah. Ignore that number. That's actually a, a, a formula that's not operating. That should be 125, um, and that it is actually working that way. So then, what happens with the um, exhibitor? So. If you remember from the, uh, the audience research uh, and the, the theater manager's research, I should say, that, that I presented earlier, the average annual attendance, and again, that probably represents only a very few theaters. The range, as we saw, is below 50,000 to over 400,000. But the average, for the purpose of analysis, 150,000. The average ticket price of 585, I lifted directly from the research. And so you see, and now I haven't included concessions, so I simplified. I mean, that would be an extra revenue source if the theaters count that. Not all theaters do. And um, now I'm not saying, again, this is no one theater client's p and uh, Some theaters make money, some theaters lose money. I would hazard a guess, by the way, the relationship of the operating costs to the rest of the revenue picture is probably, uh, you know, I, I didn't do a survey of all these costs, but I worked on quite a number of, of assignments where I've seen versions of this. I used to, I used to um, develop and operate theaters, uh, quite a number of them. So I think this is a reasonable illustration uh, to, to make the point that it's probably, on average, not much more than a break-even business. And that's important to remember because if you're booking an A film, and of course every producer sets out to make a film that's going to be the A film and just do gangbusters in the marketplace, remember the theater too is counting on that A film to deliver a good chunk of their annual attendance. So if it falls short of expectations, it does actually hurt everybody. This column here um, is kind of, don't, I wouldn't dwell too much on this because it, and I don't think most of you, most, most of the theater people would think this way in terms of allocating um, your expenses uh, to a particular film other than the um, other than license fees. So that's a quick navigation. Now, I, in the interest of time, I'm absolutely not I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm not going to put you to sleep by explaining all of this. But suffice it to say, it actually does work. Um, the math does check out. It does represent uh, some realities. Um, and uh, anyway, this is all, this is how the sausage got made, I guess is the way to say it. Um, there are a few more input variables here that I didn't put on the master sheet. You can see um, the, the average lease assumptions that weren't on that first, that first key variables page. Um, you can see the distribution fees assumptions, uh, again, for the sort of the lesser theatrical types. Um, over here is important too, I think, because um, I want to, I want to, I want to stress this for a moment. I made some assumptions. I built into the model uh, a certain fraction of the underlying number of giant screen film licenses that are represented by full dome licenses or other flat screen licenses or theme park or special venue licenses. Now, in each of these cases, well, certainly in full dome and theme park cases, you have to repurpose your content to make it suitable for those platforms. Again, these percentages are the to get at the number of leases. It's not a license fee, it's not a distribution fee. So if I have 100 licenses, 
that means we're, we're going to have 15 full dome licenses. Uh, we're going to have uh, 10 uh, other flat screen licenses. We're going to have eight, uh, eight um, theme park licenses. Theme park licenses are probably 12 to 14 minute cut. A full dome is going to be repurposed for full dome. These actually do represent a reality that I've worked with. I'm not going to say which titles they were. It's an amalgam. In fact, it's not a particular title. It's an amalgam of, of experience that I've had in all these different uh, media types. So back to, back to my, uh, my cover, my key variables. So again, see, see the result. Now, now let's see what happens if we take the better case. All right. So the better case is, and it'll change. Oops. Oh, it will, really. Hang on. Do that again. I'm just going to copy and paste this over. Hang on, sorry. Okay, so there I've copied over the better case. Um, you can see 138 licenses in Presto. You end up with an ultimate GBO of 28 million a producer's profit of 2.7 million, and there's your economic return of 20%. All right, so that's, uh, that's another scenario. And, uh, and of course, if I were to show you all the other summary P&Ls, uh, you know, there's, there are more, uh, those are some more details before the, the even more detailed page. So you can see the, distri distri you know, the combined producer-distributor's five-year P&L goes up to 30% IRR. Okay, so then going back to, um, let's do a best case. We'll go to a best case. And by the way, best case is the best case I'm showing you today. Um, you could come up with an even better case than this one. I have heard of ultimate numbers of licenses that exceed 108. Now, by the way, again, this number of licenses is the giant screen theater licenses only. And for those of you who are not aware of the sort of metrics of the overall market, there aren't that many more than 200 giant screens that you can distribute to if it's a 40-minute do documentary product anyway. So. If you're going to get them all, maybe you get to 200 on that line that says 180, but it's not going to be much more than that. Um, and so you can see what happens. Your producer's IRR goes all the way up to 35%. Now, let's say, let's say we, we should probably know, and anyone who's planning a film ought to know what their break-even scenario is. And, and by this, I mean on a cash break-even. So there's our cash break-even. So we, our ultimate GBO is 16 million. And, uh, but you know what, it still takes, in this, in this set of circumstances, it still takes us um, 103 licenses at an average of almost 35,000 per. Now, if you, I'll just scan across there. You can see what I did here. So this is a wrap of what I did. Uh, good, better, best, and break even. And I, what I did is uh, I basically varied the number of licenses, the average li uh, licensee revenue per theater. I also varied um, the ancillary, the, the sub, the sub giant screen theatrical penetration. So you can, and I also varied the ancillaries uh, here. So non GS, if it was a non GS theatrical distribution, I gave it a, uh, I used all those percentages I showed before. If, if I was kind of hedging, I gave it a 0.5. If I knocked it out, I would give it a zero. So, and on the break even, on a break even analysis, it's probably prudent to just say, forget about those extra markets. I want to know what I need to do to just break even on the giant screen release, because presumably that's the main reason why you're producing the film. So that, that pretty well does it. Now, I, in the interest of time, um, I won't run through um, a whole bunch of other scenarios. I could, I could flex number of licenses, average license fee per theater, um, and the maximum equity investment some more so that you can see what happens. Um, but all the, you know, the model is very sensitive to all this. Oh, by the way, I should show you this. So in this case, um, this is a very simplified version of a budget. Again, I pick six million, could be seven to 10, could be four to five. But the way this model works is you, you pick the maximum production cost, you pick the maximum equity you're prepared to put in, and the difference is split up somewhat arbitrarily between grants and sponsorships and tax credits. It could have been, it could have been it could, in this case, it could have been three and a half million grants if I wanted to. Although our panel will speak to this about how easy or hard that is. Um, to get to some of those numbers. Um, and then finally, on the waterfall, uh, and I should probably just zip really quickly through this, um, implicit in all of this is a certain order of how the cash goes out and how it comes back in. So you start off when the cash goes, so this is from the producer's point of view. Producer 
um, in this case, is parting with two and a half millions of two and a half million of their own cash. I'm not showing the money coming in from sponsorship going out. I'm just showing what their net cash outlay is. In my model, I've got most producers, even though they may turn it over to a distributor, they still do some of their own marketing. They, they do the B2B marketing before they do maybe do some some consumer marketing. It's not a lot, but it's some. You've got the now. In some cases, not all. Uh, you've got you may have a dis distributor's van. Don't get don't hang on that five hundred thousand. It could be a lot less or nothing. It could be more. Um, then we've got the cash coming back in. So you've got a distributor, DSTBO, distributor share of box office. They get that coming in. They recover their uh, marketing uh, and distribution expenses. They, they collect their distribution fees, which they have by contract uh, with their producer if it's a separate entity, or even if it's not a separate entity. You know, the department probably still has to allocate a certain revenue as if they were uh, dealing arm's length with their, their production unit. The distributor recovers its MG in this case nets down to an amount that is ultimately what goes back to the producer, and, uh, and so that um, zeroes, well, basically zeroes out to uh, well, $4 left. So that's the waterfall, and uh, now in the theatrical world, in the theatrical world, there's a different way of doing it. I won't stress on that. For those of you who come from that world, you'll, you'll know where that is. It's in terms of the rank order of, of, of when you start, um, of what the percentage is, and, and uh, when you start splitting the money coming back from theaters. But I won't, in the interest of time, I won't get into that other example. So with that, I hope you're still with me. I know it's, uh, there's, there, there's a lot there. So with that, what I'd like to do is throw it over to the panel and to talk about um, the model and um, you know, how does this, how, how does your reality reflect this? Um, what, it, maybe you want to start with the, the film financing and uh, what are the challenges, what are the obstacles? Do you agree that you really do have to find that amount of money? Is it really the case that two and a half million dollars is just about all the money that acting economically, rationally, is about all you'd want to put in. So who would like to take that question first? Okay. Hike. There we go. We can pass it down the line. It, yeah, two and a half is a, a pretty good on average number for the amount of equity you can have in a film at, you know, a six million dollar budget, which is, is frighteningly modest in this world. You can do it for less. There are a lot of different ways to skin the cat. The three of us have tr tried them all. Um, and something at some point we, we should dive into in this conversation is that big three and a half million dollar gap. I mean, the numbers, when they work, um, the sort of elephant in the room is that there's gotta be three and a half million dollars in your project of money that nobody wants to recoup, which is outrageously hard money to raise. Um, but yes, and so if you can raise three and a half million, um, which can sometimes take years, then yes, two and a half million is the amount of equity you want in your project. If you can't raise three and a half million, you need to tweak some other variables. That's a really quick answer. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the bottom line of this is do not try and make these films unless you're prepared to go look for money that is not about uh, getting an economic return. It is very difficult and, it does, and you have to take a bit of a different attitude than in the television business, which we are also in and we produce, for example, a, uh, a television series about water that my son over there does. And uh, um, he, I introduced him yesterday to Jeff Kirsch and uh, uh, I said, oh, we're going to try and bring him into the giant screen world and uh, my son then said to Jeff, yeah, um, I've made 21 episodes of this series and you're still looking for the money for your film, which is kind of the way it goes in the television versus the uh, film side. Um, the thing about the non-recouping sponsorship kind of money to bear in mind is that is to really, all of the work that's been done, uh, the research that's been done to paint a picture of our market, that, that research is incredibly important because what we are selling to the most important part of the financing of every one of our films is not the economic return, it's the kind of audience, the places where the films play, the opportunity to have a presence in that kind of market, the opportunity to impact people in the way that the giant screen can do in these informal learning environments. And really what you find is that you're asking uh, money from people who do not have a line item in their budget for what you're asking them for. So 90 to 98% of the time, you get nowhere. 
but the thing that's interesting is that when you find the right company or person or foundation um, that tweaks to what you want to accomplish, the numbers are not scary at all. I mean, the, the numbers are not big because there's a lot of money sloshing around out there looking for a proper place to put itself, not necessarily on an economic return basis if you're talking to foundations or mission-minded institutions or mission-minded companies or mission-minded individuals. So, you know, don't be overly daunted by it, but be prepared that it's going to take quite a lot of time and you have to find a way to get to the decision makers because uh, people in very, what you would think are very senior positions in this environment, in the corporate world in particular, operate inside of a very tight box. And so they have a hundred million dollars to spend on marketing, but guess what? And they spend a hundred million dollars a year on marketing, but guess what? They are spending it in accordance with a very strictly defined set of things they can spend it on, and it doesn't include making one of these films. So you can only get to the CEO, chair of the board, that kind of level. That's where these decisions happen, period. So those are the people you have to get to. Anyway, I'll pass it on to Don if you have anything to add. Yeah, I was just going to say that the uh, cost basis, we, we, we define a film's break-even point as a cost basis that is the two and a half number. And um, I would say uh, we typically estimate between a two and three million dollar point. Uh, so two and a half is right in the middle. Um, I think f even for like, I think what you were showing there was a clear A topic, uh, a film that's going to do 100 to 125 leases. So there are a lot of B topics out there and C topics that are still films that, you know, shouldn't necessarily not be made for this market. I mean, they, um, different museums have different missions. You have aquariums, you have natural history museums, um, science centers, and, you know, some science films uh, will work mainly only at the science centers and some uh, natural history films won't show at as many science centers. I think that's going to be even more the case in the years ahead, potentially, um, uh, with the proliferation of, of, of films uh, we're seeing. So, um, again, it just makes it all the more daunting. I think for a B topic, I think you're probably looking at having a one to one and a half million dollar uh, cost basis, not a two to three. Um, but on the other hand, I think that, that what Jonathan um, was talking about is, is that these companies, there, there is a lot of value to be, to be gained for, for, for a company for sponsoring one of these films. And um, it's our job as producers to really, to make that case compelling one. And not only that, but to, uh, but to ensure that they maximize on the opportunity once they decide to sponsor, then it, it's incumbent upon us to convince them to not only pay the upfront money, you know, that's, that's going to uh, cover that production gap, but in addition to, to, to uh, devote activation uh, dollars to really, you know, helping the theaters have success with the films. We are, we're all in this market together, and the exhibitors have cut back on their marketing expenditures over the past 15, 20 years. And so, uh, it's it's ideal when you can find a sponsor that can um, that can, uh, on a per market basis, give you know, 25, 50, 75, even 100 thousand dollars. I know uh, that uh, both uh, all three of our companies have, have really worked at that. And, had some really good activations um, in, in, the, in the past. Yeah. Um, great, thank you. Um, so, as we saw in the uh, the research, the theater research, uh, the the attendance trend, unfortunately, is more decreasing than anything. Um, that's impacting the average license fee, um, as the number of different titles on the program in any given week or during a whole year has increased, that has impacted average license fees. Um, and the installed base of theaters, at least the giant screen theaters, is not going up. It's just about flat, exactly flat over the last 10 years. There have been a few that have closed, but a couple have come back on stream. But um, that puts pressure on that average lease variable. and. Um, and so it must be a concern. It's a key driver to the model. What can producers, distributors do with the, working with theaters to try to reverse that trend on that average lease per theater? Because it's so important to the model. Lisa, do you want to take that? Sure. Well, I think, 
I, you know, that comes down to marketing, A, and, and supporting the marketing with your sponsorship and your foundation grant money and partners. Um, it also comes down to making a great film because um, there are certainly films, I could name a lot of them, that if a theater has said, I'm going to take this for three months and then said, wow, this is really doing well, I'm going to hold it another nine months and I'm going to keep it in my library forever. One of the factors in doing that, um, in their decision to do that, is how strongly you resonate with the educational community because they get a lot of money from field, field trip traffic. And if you are a real winner in that area, this gets a little bit into our storytelling topics later, but um, those are two really easy ways, not easy, but um, two of the obvious ways to do it. There's, there's not a lot you can do. I mean, I, I've been spending a lot of time looking at the ways to reversion and repurpose the content. We all have to do that. The good news is that televisions are moving to HDR, virtual realities coming in. Um, there's some stream, 3D streaming platforms that are coming online that are offering really nice returns to, to producers. And I think in addition to trying to support the theaters as much as we can and to not um, eat into their profits by going into the ancillary markets too soon, you've got to also grow those ancillary revenue streams um, in really aggressive ways and, and look for those solutions. Well, I think the, um, uh, you know, one of the, one of the big issues is in the conversion to digital, when there's, and there's, I'm not making these remarks uh, hoping to reverse reality, but this uh, conversion to digital has resulted, as Paul's graphs of, or information earlier today showed, in uh, more titles. And so there's been this, at the same time as there's been a decrease in marketing spend uh, over time from previously, there's been an increase in number, of, and it's been replaced in a sense because these institutions are under uh, economic pressure and then what do you cut? Often it's marketing that gets cut and then they look at the results and see them going down and say, well, hmm, we've cut our marketing and now we have less people. Gee, I wonder why. Um, but uh, as the um, marketing spend is going down, it's replaced by, well, let's, I mean, I'm exaggerating to make the point, of course, and there's no one institution doing this, but let's throw seven titles on the screen and then it, as long as people are showing up, they choose whichever one. And I think that we have to be uh, ready to have winners and losers. Um, and the winners, uh, you, I think, as an industry as, or as in individual institutions, really identifying a winner and supporting a winner and uh, making a winner really work is very important. And there are institutions who do that very, very well. They tend to be institutions that have that have more limited number of films and more at stake for the success of a film. So, I mean, that's a direction where, as a producer and distributor, uh, I'm very interested in that kind of scenario where, you know, I'm prepared, we are prepared at our company to have, uh, to have our film be a winner or a loser. Of course, we all think ours is going to be a winner. Um, but uh, I think we should, you know, that's, that's the reality out there in the big world, and it should be the reality in our world. There's going to be winners and losers. And of course, we've all made our share of dogs, and I include myself in that. And we've all, uh, you know, all three of us have certainly made, you know, winners as well. And uh, so I think we want to work with the theater community in terms of answering that question. You know, how do we really encourage the, the, as much success as possible for the winners? Yeah, I would, I would reiterate uh, Jonathan's point about uh, in, this, in this digital era, theaters should resist the, the temptation to just you know, acquire seven or eight DCPs because they're now no longer costing what film prints did and just playing a, a, a schedule and not focusing in on, and launching um, select films that they deem to be uh, the better ones. Um, the other thing I, would, uh, I should add is, is that uh, I think as an industry, we have a real opportunity here with the uh, switchover, with the transition to digital, um, theaters in our market are going to be saving um, several hundreds of thousands of dollars each year in, in annual operating costs. Um, and uh, to, to, uh, rather than just taking all that savings and, and putting it to the bottom line, to, to really look at the savings, um, however they're coming from. But, but literally, there are some theaters that will save 
half a million dollars uh, a year, the theaters that are the highest performing ones t will, will save even, will, will tend to save the most. Um, and, and, but taking uh, some percentage of that savings and, and applying it to, to marketing the films uh, and to marketing the, the museum and the, if there's a film exhibit tie-in to marketing the two together. But, but really, it would be great to see uh, some of those theater-generated savings being directed to theater-oriented marketing. Great, thanks, Don. So um, I want to ask uh, our panel about ancillaries and and the other than giant screen theatrical windows. So as just a bit of background, so this is a piece of the this is a piece of the detailed P and L, uh, and you see around here I've got five million um, in uh, license fee revenue coming back from the, the giant screen release, but, you know almost eight hundred thousand dollars coming from other theatrical platforms. And in this particular, this is, by the way, this is the good scenario. It's, it's you know, not the breakout, it's not the home run, but it's decent. 125 giant screen leases. And we've got almost 350,000 in ancillaries. So, um, and compared, of course, theatrical, that's a small number. But every, you all know, every bit helps. And, and I know that there's sometimes a tension. You know, you've, you've got these other theatrical windows. You've got to protect your core, which is giant screen. But you can't not have your eye on this ball, on these other, on these other windows. You've got to be looking for full dome. You've got to be looking at, you've got to look at everything. You've got to look at ancillaries, uh, which have never been a high percentage of box office uh, for most distributors. Um, so can the panel address that? How do you, um, how, how, much, how much emphasis are you putting on ancillaries? You probably agree with me that it's important. And is there upside there? I mean, I suppose in an ideal world, if you could really grow that, it might take pressure off the average license fee that you require from giant screens, the, the giant screen theaters. But how much emphasis are you putting on ancillaries? And do you see, uh, do you have reason for optimism there? Who wants to take that? Don first. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can give it to Don. Don. Okay, Don. Okay. Yeah, I think Lisa touched on it earlier, but I, I, you know, we are, uh, you know, looking at it, when the when the giant screen portion shrinks and you see some of these other uh, ancillary sources growing, um, you do tend to look at those and take them more seriously. Um, we're not. I don't think there's uh, a lot of cannibalization out there, at least to date. But um, for some of the more uh, you know prominent films that are that are that are generating more in giant screen business than others. Um, they need to be careful to, 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 in terms of the timing of when they're going to exploit those um, ancillary windows. But um, yeah, yeah. I think the the, the fundamental question is, uh, you know, do the, um, from the point of view of those of you wanting to make films, the ancillary market is uh, sort of more or less from our point of view. It's it's a zero impact um, in, at the point of putting a film together uh, and funding the film because we're making the film for this market and we're focusing on this market. Obviously when it comes to the back end and we're distributing the film, we are doing uh, as much as we can to leverage that, but the numbers, I mean, we're not, we are not as a company looking to the fabulous ancillary market for films that were designed, conceived, edited, framed, etc., for a giant screen experience and looking to the vast amounts of revenue they're going to flow from putting that film out there for purposes for which it was never designed, conceived, framed, or edited. We will, on the other hand, of course, do everything possible. So we've, you know, we've done that with, uh, with Flight of the Butterflies. We've made a 14-minute special venue film that is fantastically successful, and it's like an annuity where it's playing. It's fantastic. So, yeah, that's great. You can do that. But it, we never would have that in our mind on day one as being a fundamental part of what's going to make the thing happen. I actually have a kind of different way of looking at that. I do have all these ancillary opportunities in mind from day one the main core film and the bread and butter is coming from the giant screen industry and that's where you have to you have to please that world first and foremost but i think if you go into these these things 
knowing you want to create a virtual reality experience or a digital dome experience, you may do a couple additional things in the field to help you create those ancillary products down the line. And I think it really helps your sponsorship pitch because it, the, the digital dome, full dome world is, is actually growing, unlike the giant screen world. And so while there's not a lot of revenue there, there are eyeballs there. And sponsors and uh, foundations are really interested in those eyeballs and in um, reaching more audiences in different ways. We all know the virtual reality business is not a business yet, but it is coming fast and furious. And they're, they all see an opportunity in looking at our content and ways to use that in a virtual reality space. And so I think we should be going into these things knowing we're going to go into as many platforms as we can, but making sure that doesn't compromise the production methodology for this business, because this is the, still the main revenue stream. Yeah, I just want to underscore one thing, which is, um, uh, the key thing to bear in mind if you're thinking of the ancillary market so is, uh, and we've faced this on one particular project where the, a, a founding financial partner wants to have a television show as well. So what we said, is, and that's great, we said fantastic, only the deal is we're making a, the script for our giant screen film we're getting that completely clear and straight and settled. Then we will turn our attention to this other version that we're going to do because the other way around has not proven to be very successful or compelling. And I think there's been some evidence of that in terms of presentations over the last few years of films that are derived from other media, which some of which you know, are fine and some of which are not so fine. That's a personal view. But I think it's a view shared by quite a few uh, exhibitors out there uh, because what hasn't, and, and it's actually an easy problem to solve. If you're making a television show that has a, uh, that you think will have a giant screen life because of topic, et cetera, uh, and subject matter, then that's great. But before you start shooting, write your giant screen script and your shot list or else you're going to be struggling uh, when you come to the other end. So one, one last topic here I want to dive into is the mix, uh, the mix of non-participating, non-equity funding. So in this example, we have grants and sponsorships, we have tax credits. Can the panelists talk to that? What's, what's going on in, in, in your pursuit of that kind of money? What are the trends? What are the challenges? How do you view that mix of non-participating uh, funds that are needed for your productions? Let me speak to grants and pass it to you to speak to government stuff, I think is how we broke this up. Um, you, you know, you can, obviously we can all do our research on foundations that are out there. There are a lot of them. There are a lot of people looking to, to create a legacy with their philanthropic money. They're really hard to find and not a lot of them have, um, like corporations, very few of them have um, putting money into IMAX films as a part of their philanthropic legacy. Occasionally you can convince them that that's a really great way to do it. It's, it's a hard sell. Um, I'll, let me just speak briefly to three sources of revenue that, that many of us are aware of. And the, the big elephant in the room is the National Science Foundation. A lot of us have had grants from NSF. I've had four or five. Um, they are absolutely, it comes from their informal science education group. They're absolutely grueling application processes. I don't think any of us would do it if they didn't give up to $3 million. Um, so it is definitely worth it, but it's an expensive and time consuming undertaking. You've got to hire a professional grant writer that is not cheap, um, but there's good, good money there if, you, if you're making a film that really fits what they're looking for. The other two kind of new sources in the industry, again, are, um, you know, everybody here is looking for quality, not quantity. But um, HHMI uh, has Tangle Bank Studios. Michael Rosenfeld was here earlier in the week. Um, again, they're looking for one or two really targeted films that teach um, science. Their core buckets are human anatomy, anatomy neuroscience, evolution, conservation. Um, and they have really strict criteria, but they have 
money and they're entertaining proposals. And then we all know IMAX Film Fund announced their $50 million fund. I chatted with them recently about what they're looking for. Again, um, not looking for a lot of projects. Uh, ideally, they're looking for projects that are coming in with maybe up to half of their money in hand. Uh, and as you can tell from the first two films, they've greenlit through that fund. One is a Terrence Malick project and one is a um, Werner Herzog project. So um, big talent attached is obviously appears to be something that would help you get through that process. But those are three um, sources to think about if your projects fit those. Yeah, um, in addition to that, and we've had the good fortune of having two of those three in the current film that we're putting together. Uh, and it is, you know, it is difficult. But there are also other, I'll just quickly say there, there, as Lisa has mentioned, there are others out there and there are some that are, you know, uh, with their mission, they may not have put money into a giant screen film before, but there are some good targets out there. So I encourage you to, you know, mine that field. Um, in addition, there are, uh, there are government incentives uh, around the world. Uh, and I'll just say that it, it's not so much um, applicable to Americans because, for instance, in Canada, we have, we have a subsidy system, uh, tax credits, and other incentives for national, particularly for national, we have tax credits for national and not national films. In other words, if you come and shoot a film in Canada, you can get tax credits but you can also get additional incentives if you are a Canadian film. And I'm mentioning this because Canada has entered into co-production treaties with more countries than any other country in the world. And those co-production treaties have at their absolute foundation, it is fair to say, uh, beating, uh, beating away uh, uh, the giant elephant of Hollywood and the US. So no Americans welcome is kind of the underlying message, but in fact, there are lots of ways that we can collaborate uh, with American partners on film. So this, you know, we made Flight of the Butterflies as a Canada, Mexico, UK co-production with plenty of American involvement. We are doing the same thing on our Amazon adventure film. So um, you get, the way it works in 30 seconds is that there are national benefits and subsidies in various countries. They're, they're in France, they're in England, they're in, South America, they're in Mexico, they're in China, they're all over the world, India. And these co-production treaties, if you, if you structure your film to meet the criteria set out in the treaties, you get the benefits of both countries. So, you know, uh, Flight of the Butterflies was a Mexican film, pure Mexican film. It was a pure Canadian film, it was a pure UK film from the point of view of qualifying for incentives. And that's very useful. And those of you who are putting together films, you know, you can come up with innovative structures to benefit from that, even if you're not from one of those countries, but things like what your title is and how things work will be affected by meeting those regulations. So that's one thing. And another is uh, uh, tax credits, which are sometimes, as I say, available, whether or not you meet those criteria just by filming in various places. There are incentives around the world. So there's a whole array of them all around the world that are useful because they can sometimes be, you know, 20% of the costs or, well, 25 or it sort of averages down lower than that, but of what you spend. So if you go to, if you go to England and spend $5 million, you're, you're, you're going to get a million bucks of that financed. So there you just got a million dollars of your financing. Pretty good. Um, so those are a couple of things to mention. Anything else, Don? Uh, yeah, I should point out that, you know, Paul's chart had $6 million as sort of your average budget. Um, there are topics out there that you can produce for, uh, for less than, than six, maybe four or five, maybe even under four. Um, now, obviously, you're, you're, you're still going to want to maintain sort of the, 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 the quality standards of this format. But if you pick a subject matter that has, you know, one or two locations versus seven or eight, um, obviously, your production budget is going to be lower. So um, I would encourage people that are, especially for, for people that are interested in, in producing uh, films on subjects that, subjects that aren't necessarily going to get 100, 125 leases, um, to look at that in addition to the free money uh, sources. Um, I can think of, uh, you know, an example of a film uh, we produced, uh, Tornado Alley, which 
um, was shot in you know hundreds of locations, but it was a, a skeleton uh, crew uh, over eight years and uh, documentary style. And as a result, that film, even though we were in all these locations, um, you know, came in under six million dollars uh, budget. You know, and another film we did, Mummies. Um, uh, the opposite, uh, high-end production sets uh, in Morocco, um, in particular, uh, you know, hundreds of extras, et cetera. Um, fortunately, in that film, uh, Miles, who's in the back there, was, was part of that. We uh, discovered a, uh, a, a studio set uh, at, a, at, the, at the largest studio in the world in Morocco. Um, it was, I think, I believe, um, one of the European television production companies had just made a $3 million um, TV show, um, yeah, Egyptian-themed, ancient Egyptian-themed TV show. And they had this unbelievable set there that had been built already. It was in place. It was a little bit, uh, you know, it, was, it had been used a year earlier, so we had to buy some paint and a few other things. But literally, uh, it was a, a couple of million dollar set that we were able to um, upgrade for you know, 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars. And all of a sudden, we found you know, free production value, so to speak. So there are ways for producers to be, uh, to be innovative uh, and do things like that and able to, um, again, keep the standards of this industry as high as they've always been, um, but figure out ways to get creative and, 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 uh, and produce films for less. We also used part of that same set for Journey to Mecca, so thank you, Don. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I would just emphasize what Don said, uh, which is uh, on the lower budget side, you know, it is really critical that we remain focused on quality because one of the, one of the scary potential uh, directions here is, you know, when we uh, lower the, the, the quality, forget the budget, lower the quality, you know, people go into the cinema and they don't have a good experience, they don't want to come back, maybe they'll come back one more time, and we start to lose those people. That's the lifeblood of, of what we do. So those quality standards are really high, and it, it, I think if films get made cheaper than they should for what they are, um, then uh, we're going to run that risk, which doesn't mean there can't be economically, you know, viable lower budget films, but whatever it is, that eye on quality has to be absolutely ferocious, in my opinion, if we're going to keep this going. Well, thank you, panelists. We're just about out of time. We're gonna, we have lunch coming up soon. However, we, we do have, I guess we have about five minutes uh, for Q&A. That may not be enough time, but the conversation can continue over lunch. But let's throw this out to the floor. If anyone would like to ask a question, step up to the mic and uh, direct them to the panelists you'd like to speak to. <laughs> I know all the secrets. Uh, two questions, actually. The first one is, can you just quickly touch on the amount of time, effort, and investment that goes into raising this money? Because <laughs> I've been around it, and I'm constantly in awe. I actually thought Barker had a family in Mexico at one point. Um, but it's just massive, and I think that it's an important thing that needs to be recognized. The other question is, can you envision a project that would have like a net zero negative cost, where the sponsorship, tax credits, everything would, would result in the full budget, or is that a complete fantasy? Let me just, I'll give you a quick answer. The, the last uh, film I released last year, Mysteries of the Unseen World, took me between six and seven years to raise the non-equity money. So that's a very quick answer to that. We had, had NSF and two sponsors. Um, what was your second question? Zero, the, zero equity. Oh, zero equity. I had one of those. Yes, I had a phil phil philanthropist come to us and say, I'll put up half the money. And we hired a sponsorship guy who made, had a huge call list, made one phone call, got the other half of the budget. It's one time in my whole career, but miracles happen. Yeah, it can take a very long time. I and mean, certainly Flight of the Butterflies took a long time, as you well know, Miles, because you worked on it from the first concept, essentially. Um, and as uh, my wife, Wendy McKeegan, uh, she pointed out, and I had not noticed this, but um, in, in, we raised quite a lot of the money in Mexico, and uh, she counted that I had 50 five-zero trips to Mexico to raise that money over a 
approximately five year period. So it was pretty brutal and it was a significant investment that our company made because uh, in addition to the investment made in the NSF application, which was very expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not for the faint of heart to uh, look for uh, any of this kind of money, particularly large uh, sums, because it just takes that much longer. Um, and in terms of, uh, yes, it's, I'll tell you that the starting point that we would have on any film is to have zero equity. I mean, that's the way to go, because everyone wins, uh, other than the people who put the money in. Um, <laughs> but they win, t they win too if you deliver on what you promise them, because they're not looking for money. So everybody literally is a winner in that scenario. Uh, I have uh, had that experience, uh, uh, sort of, but in the experience I had, the only money that was equity was ours, and it was significant, and it, it worked but it was still significant. I mean, the way we had to fill the final gap was with our own money, and it was real cash. Yeah, uh, years ago we had a film uh, in development uh, titled The Civil War, um, and I decided to give up on it when the amount of time I was in development was longer than the Civil War itself. So, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> it took four and a half years in development. Uh, and actually, we just greenlit a film on the Hundred Years' War, so that, that's uh, my <laughs> great-grandkids will be trying to get that one going. <laughs> anyway, um, but, but yeah, no, it's, it's, that would be a dream. We have yet to have a film that has, where the sponsorship uh, amount was equal to or exceeded the, the cost of the budget. Um, but that would, that would be great. I, and like I said earlier, I think that, that there are a lot of the reasons why companies sponsor these films, um, it rarely has to do with the number of eyeballs in terms of the, uh, you know, how many impressions. I mean, that, that, that's a factor, but a lot of times these films deliver a lot of value to, um, to companies, to, to, to sponsors on more of a B2B level, being able to host uh, VIP premieres with, you know, high-end uh, uh, customers and clients, uh, you know, and doing special screenings at museums. And, um, and, you know, in addition to that, I think a lot of these, again, it's the image, it's, it's, it's the association with um, these inspiring educational, um, you know, movies in the ultimate film format. Um, and uh, and there, there are opportunities at the museums um, that, you know, museums want to work with sponsors. and. Uh, especially when there's um, opportunities for sponsors to, to generate exposure and publicity in a, in a positive way. And so, um, again, I think that w when you get sponsors, not only should you be playing up the, the, those B2B, uh, you know, r real valuable B2B uh, opportunities, but also uh, playing up the, uh, the ability to activate with the, with the museums and to do things to to make it a win and to, and to actually drive people to the theater, that even though that's not the primary objective of the sponsor. Obviously, they want to get more people seeing the film and having their commercial or whatever it is on screen in, in, in the dark room and eight stories high. But, but um, yeah, that's what I would say there. I got a question. I want to put you guys on the spot. And I ask you about batting averages. So of the large format films that you have produced, how many of them have broken even to making money versus how many have lost money on a percentage basis, would you say? Can I go first? No. Um, I, uh, I think I've been involved in one that didn't recoup. It's, it's money and all the rest have been profitable. It depends who you're asking. I mean, really, Joe, uh, you know, if you're asking, did the equity recoup and make a profit, uh, regardless of how much, it's, it's kind of, a, in some ways, it's not an appropriate question, because uh, it's, there's an amount of equity, and we've looked at it, there's an amount of equity that you should not put more than that in if you want to make a profit. So, and a lot of the equity in these films and I've seen it a number of times, and we go after it regularly, is soft equity. 
In other words, it's equity that is only partially about the money. And I've had situations where the equity will be perfectly happy to get 25% of its money back, or it will be perfectly happy to get 100 or 150% of its money back. It depends. So uh, it isn't as simple as saying, has, how many times has the equity recovered and gone into profit? Because it's different in every scenario. And we've had all of the different scenarios in our business. Um, one of the things about this, this business is it's that these films have a very long shelf life. Um, and I think that's extremely important uh, as it relates to um, this recoupment process, we call it. Um, uh, to, to answer your question, about 50% of the films we've made have passed that recoupment point. Um, but mo most of the films we've produced um, have been released from 2007 uh, onward. Um, and so to give you an example, so they're, they're still in the market um, uh, and, and, and getting there. I know there's a film that we, um, that we did, we released in 2007. Um, and uh, it's about 92% of the way there. Um, and I just did a flat fee deal um, a couple of weeks ago uh, that will get it to 100%. So, and it literally, that, that's, that's right. eight years from uh, Rush, and, and it's one of our, our more successful films from a box office standpoint. Um, so it's, it, it's, a, it, it's, 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 it's not an easy road um, from a, you know, an equity investment standpoint. Um, but to allude to Jonathan's, I mean, I think that, that there, are, there are some that, that maybe they're not expecting 100% back or maybe they're, um, equi they're, they're investors who are also involved in the film as producers or as distributors um, who are, um, you know, earning, uh, you know, uh, some income, you know, via those routes. Just one thing I wanted to clarify from earlier, which is that the... Uh, in terms of the sponsorship and the NSF, I just wanted to make sure it's very clear because we are a Canadian company. We've been fortunate to have NSF funding on two of our projects, but that funding only came as a result of partnerships with U.S. institutions who received these grants. So um, rest assured, those of you in the U.S., that the U.S. government is not providing us money. They're providing money to U.S. institutions who are benefiting from that. Uh, let me just say that the, uh, the reason I answered the way I did is I think we've had really stringent green light criteria, and I see that getting harder um, to put together a project that meets those green light criteria.